Amen. Glad that everybody could be out tonight. Sorry, I was running a little bit late. It's all Mary's fault. Yeah, it's all Mary's fault. Yeah. I was sitting outside in the van waiting, and she didn't show up. So tonight, I would lock. I would. Yeah. Tonight, I would like to talk to you about lost opportunities. Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. How many have regretted missing out on an opportunity in your life? In your life? How many times have we said, if I only would have? Our text, Ephesians 5.16, talks about redeeming the time. And I am up here sitting before you admitting that I don't always do that. I don't always redeem the time. I'll be with somebody, I should say something, and I walk away and then I say to myself, if only I would have. The term redeem can mean to buy back or to buy up. Uh, in this passage, it means to buy up or to make the best use of our time. Uh, the book, uh, A Cup of uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul by Nick Lazarus, he wrote this story in there. I had, often, I had offered to watch my three-year-old daughter, Ramanda, so that my wife could go out with a friend. I was getting some work done while Ramanda appeared to be having a good time in the other room. No problem, I figured. But then it got a little too quiet, and I yelled out, What are you doing, Remanda? No response. I repeated my question and heard her say, Oh, nothing, nothing. What does nothing mean? I got up from my desk and ran out into the living room, whereupon I saw her take off, take off down the hall. I chased her up the steps and watched her as she, her little behind made a hard left into the bathroom. I was gaining on her. She took off, the, off for the bathroom. Bad move. I had her cornered. I told her to turn around. She refused. I pulled out my big, mean, authoritative daddy voice. Young lady, I said, turn around. Slowly, she turned towards me. In her hand was what was left of my wife's new lipstick. And every square inch of her face was covered with bright red, except her lips, of course. As she looked up at me with fearful eyes, lips trembling, I heard every voice that had been shouted to me as a child. How could you? You should know better than that. How many times have you been told? What a bad thing to do. It was just a matter of my picking out which old message I was going to use on her so that she would know what a bad girl she had been. But before I could let loose, I looked down at the sweatshirt my wife had put on her only an hour before. In big letters it said, I am a perfect little angel. I looked back up into her tearful eyes and instead of seeing a bad girl who didn't listen, I saw a child of God. A perfect little angel full of worth, value, and a wonderful spontaneity that I had come dangerously close to shaming out of her. Sweetheart, you look beautiful. Let's take a picture so mommy can see how special you look. I took the picture and thank God that I didn't miss the opportunity to reaffirm what a perfect little angel he had given me. Tonight I want us to consider the idea of lost opportunity. I'm going, to, I'm going to share some biblical examples of lost opportunities tonight. Genesis chapter 1, 28 through chapter 3, 24, tells us a very serious lost opportunity. Very serious. As far as we know, she has given secondhand information from Adam. I skipped over something, sorry about that. There are some factors to consider with Eve's temptation. One that I just realized in this study. As far as we know, she has given secondhand information from Adam about what God said about the tree, as we're told in 
Genesis 2, 17 through 19. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called them, each living creature, that was its name. You see, God told Adam, uh, Adam about the tree before Eve was even created. And I never, never really looked at it this way. Not making excuses for her, of course. They both, both fell into sin and, and ended up getting thrown out of the garden. But just giving it some consideration. Satan, when he walked, when he came up to Eve, Satan, he questioned God. He's questioning God is what he's doing. Satan misrepresents God and what he said. As he always does, right? He always does that. He always tries to re, uh, rewrite the Bible or misrepresent what it says. And then when people fall into it, he just sits back and says, I got you. You know, and I feel sorry for people that think that they are saved but if they haven't went through the right instructions in the Bible they're lost and that's right where Satan wants them because he they think that they're okay and that's what Satan does to us that's what he does the temptation and the fall of man is in Genesis 3 1 through 6 now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God made had made and he said to the woman has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan contradicts God is what he does right there. And like I say, she wasn't even there when God gave the instructions to Adam. He wasn't, she wasn't there. Then the servant, servant says to the woman, you will not surely die. And then as he always does, Satan promises great things great things when you're sinning everything's going to be great right going to have a good time with your buddies drinking and if you you know everything else you can think of doing you know it's a great time but satan tells her for god knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like god knowing good and evil Sometimes I wish I didn't know evil at all. Not at all. Could you imagine being in the Garden of Eden, being taken care of, and not knowing anything about evil because it just did not exist until Satan came and tempted her. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then in 1 John 2, 15 through 16, it tells us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in, is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Those things did not exist. Just think about that in the Garden of Eden until Adam and Eve made the mistake they did. And then another example of a lost opportunity is the story of the people of Noah's days in Genesis chapter 6. Think about this for a moment. The next time you go out and uh, you get uh, discouraged when you're evangelizing, okay? Noah preached for 100 years. And by the time he was done building the ark, the only people he could save was his eight family members. 100 years. We go on a campaign. You guys paid for that campaign, and we did, and I helped with it. Everybody helped with it that could, and we were so discouraged because we didn't get anybody that stuck we got some people that came and were baptized and then went out and 
you know. But the idea is Noah preached for a hundred years and didn't convert one person. I'd say he probably lost his job as a preacher, right? <laughs> and like I say, just think about that next time you get discouraged about people not listening to you. Because I, I tell you, I, I, I stopped getting discouraged. I really feel sorry for that person. Is you know what I mean? I, I'm not so much discouraged as I am just putting back by them not making sure that things are right with God you know 2 Peter 2 5 reads and do not spare the ancient world but save Noah one of eight people a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly hundred years he preached hundred years he built spent spent time in the ark came out of the ark and still only eight people were saved. And then we read about the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 39 through 41. Then one of the criminals who were hung, hung blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the, others, the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly, in other words, they deserved what they got. For we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Now we don't know where this man came from. We don't know how much he knew of Jesus, but I know one thing, he had faith in Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. And that's something we have to think about. Do we know who Jesus was and who Jesus is? I don't like to even say it in the past tense because he never did go anywhere. He's always been there. This was an opportunity lost and an opportunity seized because the one thief decided he was going to do the same thing that the people on the ground was doing to Jesus but the other thief decided that he was going to have faith in the Savior. And what did Jesus say to him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. And then we read about the temp attempt to convert Felix in Acts 24, 24 through 25. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Dr Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in his faith in Christ. Now as he respond, reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. How many times have you been told that by someone? Say, hey, let's study the Bible together. Well, not right now. Not right now. They leave the door open. Some just slam the door all completely. Just say, no, I'm not going to do that. Paul himself got rejected. I tell you, brethren, there is no delaying, no more convenient time. And that's what hurts me when I'm trying to evangelize and people just do not listen because I know the condition of their soul and I'm not passing judgment on them the word is it's passing judgment on them and letting them know that they're not but remember it's not you that they're rejecting it's the greatest gift you could ever offer to anyone just think about that for a moment they're not rejecting you personally now they may you know, I've had people get belligerent with me and stuff like that. They may reject you personally, but mainly what they're rejecting is they're rejecting the Word of God. And they're rejecting a gift that is worth more than... can't even put a price tag on it, really, when you come right down to it. Now, let's talk about opportunities we can afford to lose. We can't, cannot afford to lose, I'm sorry. Raising our children. I feel as I look back on my life that I kind of 
left my children in the lurch as far as church and things were concerned. I, uh, I came through the 70s and the 80s with the steel mills all shutting down, losing my job. I lost two jobs in that, in that time frame. So I had to work two jobs lots of times in order to make, put food on the table and pay the bills. I had to do that. So when you work two jobs, you're not gonna be around as much. And that's probably why I have two that are still wayward. And I know that uh, some people in this room have people, some of their children that are wayward also. We pray, we try, we work with them and we just keep working and working and working. We can't give up because we can't give up on them because that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart to know that someone that close to me could have a chance of spending eternity in torment. Ephesians 6, 4, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. My wife called me on the carpet for this one probably more, more than one occasion. I was provoking my children to wrath. And I probably was. He was probably right. And But you have to have a balance. You have to have a balance with the things that you do with your children. And even if you do everything right down to a T, still no guarantee they're still going to walk with the Lord because I know many that were raised up and walked away. And that's a sad state of affairs also. Genesis chapter 22, the story of Abraham and his faith in God. And I... I cringe every time I read this story of Abraham because I'm thinking to myself, how could you load up everything you own, <laughs> head off for a trip, I'll let you know when you get there, <laughs> just load everything up, I load everything up, take everything with you, I'll let you know when you get there, just keep going. Now what kind of faith would you have to have in someone to actually do that? He left everything and didn't even know where he was going. And also had such great faith, was willing to sacrifice his own son. There's an irony there. God sacrificed his only son, and he asked Abraham to do the same exact thing. And Abraham was about to do what the Lord told him to do. Now that's faith. That's real faith. In 1 Samuel 13, 13, we have the example of what not to do with Eli. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquities which he knows because his sons made themselves vow and he did not restrain them. How many times have you not restrained your children and thought, mm, I should have done that, I should have restrained them. And then after they grow up and leave the house, it's kind of, late then. And also in 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 23, prophecy against Eli's household. Now Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they laid with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meetings. So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. Talk about giving a bad name to a family. Now that's one thing I tried to instill in my children was that you, your name means something. Your name means something and if you destroy that name, it's very hard to gain that back. Just, with, just like with Eli here. And the greatest opportunity of all that we have on this earth is to serve the Lord. A lawyer tried to trip Jesus up in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great, great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now just think about it for a minute. If you do both of those commandments, you're doing everything that God told you to do. Everything. It includes everything because if you do that, uh, you're not going to murder anybody. You're not going to hate anybody. 
You're not going to do all the other list of things that he has that you could do. Galatians 6.10 reads, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. How many people can be changed by kindness and goodness? I told this story before about a guy at the hospital who just didn't want to have nothing to do with anybody. In fact, the guy that was breaking me in the day was breaking me in. He says, just leave that guy alone. He's the most miserable human being that you could ever meet. And I just kept pecking at him, pecking at him, pecking at him, stopping and talking to him, being nice to him, being kind to him, doing things for him that he was supposed to do himself. And eventually, he came around. If I walk in that hospital today and I see him, he'll run up to me and talk to me. I mean, that's just the, the change that he had, you know. And uh, we have to be kind and we have to be good. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Romans 2, 4 reads, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? And then in Matthew 28, 19, it tells us to speak up for the Lord. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's not, that's not just written to teachers, preachers, deacons, elders. That's written to everyone in this room. We should be making some kind of an attempt to make sure that we're telling people about God. Don't miss the opportunities that God puts before you. I had, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I have done that. I've walked away and thought, I should have said something. I should have mentioned something at least. I did start now, if, if I end the conversation and the person's walking away from me, I just say, read your Bible. And I'll get some people turn around and give me the rolling of the eyes, or I'll get somebody, ah, that's, I ain't going to do that. And I'll get people that says, I already did. And I always say, good, read it. Just keep reading it. In His providence, God does not open. God does open doors for us. In Revelation 3:8, it reads, "I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Don't deny God. We can't deny Him. We can't walk away from Him. Make yourself available." Isaiah 6:8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And walk with your eyes open. Ephesians 2.15 See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And buy up the opportunities before you right back to where we started from Ephesians 5.16 redeeming the time because the days are evil we have work to do we have hard work to do there's nothing easy about it we have to pray we have to live for God and we have to take the steps that we have to take in order to talk to people about the Lord spread the gospel as it tells us in Acts we have to do that if there's anyone here tonight that uh, has a need, please come as we stand and sing.